much for uh, coming to the first uh, first lecture here for the STS at Science Technology Studies Research Cluster, and it's being co-sponsored by Sociology Seminar Series and uh, NIST, so that's an uh, NTU Institute of Science and Technology for Humanities. Um, can I just get a sense of how many of you, I really tried to make sure it got out to scientists and engineers. Um, are any of you of those fields? Okay, great. I'm glad glad you guys are here. Thank you for thank you for coming over, finding your way down to the South Spine. Um, I'm very very pleased to introduce Professor Rupali Fadhi. She's a full professor at the Department of Environmental Studies at McAllister College, which is one of the most if you know prestigious liberal arts colleges in the United States. And prior to her position at McAllister, she was a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow in Science, Technology, and Society program at the Kennedy School at Harvard. So bridging the interdisciplinary fields of science and technology studies, environmental studies, and energy and climate policy, <coughs> Professor Fatke has shed much needed light on the politics of public deliberation, citizen science, and sustainable development in environmental debates in India, the United States, and I think her work is going a little bit more global right now, too. And she's currently the principal investigator in a multi-year um, National Science Foundation study titled Mining Futures. And she's directed the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration funded project um, in the states on diversity and deliberation and urban climate adaptation uh, called Ready and Resilient. And this received the 2016 award from the Climate Adaptation Partnership and a 2018 Minnesota Campus uh, President's Award. So, um, Professor Podke is, Podke is actually a very cherished mentor of mine over the past decade, and as such, she is modeled to be the kind of researcher and teacher that I think one, uh, well, at least I aspire to be. Her award-winning research is enhanced through her commitment to undergraduate education. Her undergrads uh, routinely produce intellectually sophisticated and readable professional products like op-eds and podcasts, websites, and have a portfolio of materials that help them uh, not only to get a good grade, of course, but in their <laughs> professional career thereafter. And, and I think this engagement with lively students uh, is very evident in Professor Fatke's thoughtful research, and her classes are places to think together and put thoughts into action. And beyond the classroom, Professor Fabke has engaged and collaborated with everyday citizens and scientists and engineers to think through sustainable development initiatives. And indeed, she was one of the co-organizers for the Worldwide Views on Climate and Energy Project sponsored by the Danish Board of Technology to provide citizen input for the UN Climate Summit. So in short, she's a kind of exemplar of the kind of scholar and teacher that I'm trying to be, one who views research and teaching as synergistic and engages in public debate instead of remaining behind um, you know, academia. So I'm delighted to host her talk at NTU, and I'm really looking forward to hearing her ideas about the material substructure of rare earth minerals that undergird all of our dreams of the fourth industrial revolution and building an entirely digital and thus electrified knowledge economy. So thank you. Thank you for such a generous introduction, and it's a delight to be here with you all. So um, as Monami mentioned, I am uh, leading an investigation for the National Science Foundation on what I've called mining futures. And what I wanted to do is share with you some of the progress um, on that project, which is still ongoing. It really thinks about the metal footprint of climate change solutions. I also co-lead a group of scholars in the field of science technology studies that is called STS Underground, which um, focuses on how we know and how we make sense of and how we describe the subterranean and subterranean extraction in particular. So we um, have had funding from the National Science Foundation. We've held workshops in Colorado, which is a mining center in the United States, also in Australia, and have some other meetings planned for this year. And so towards the end of my talk today, I'll just put, put up a slide with some of those um, forthcoming events related to that network. So I'm excited to also connect with several um, lively themes that I've, I've heard um, are current here at NTU, including thinking about responsible innovation, about um, 
emerging Asian urban centers, and also thinking about China's global and, and regional impact. So trying to connect with those themes today as well. On a more personal level, as a, as a teacher, as a professor, I spend a lot of my time, as m many of us do, with young students, um, with activists who are very passionate about addressing climate change, about thinking about climate justice. And so this research project for me is also about helping them think very deeply about the social and environmental costs of the fourth industrial revolution, of um, going green, green energy in particular, when it comes to climate solutions. There are a lot of dislocations that will happen as we make this shift, and I think it's important that we take those seriously. So I will be sharing so my insights on this Mining Futures project um, through the lens of the United States in particular and then broaden out to some of the lessons I think we can learn from the EU and, and from China in particular around alternatives to what we think of as primary mining or primary extraction. And I really look forward to your, your questions and your comments. So let me, let me get started. Um, so I had the, the privilege of attending COP21, where the UN Paris Accord was signed. Um, and I'm very happy to answer any questions you have about the post-Trump status of the Paris Accords in the US, if you're interested in that. But for now, I just wanted to flag this um, event and the Paris Accord as a kind of framing piece for the work that I'm doing. Um, I want to draw attention in particular to the recent IPCC report that very forcefully argued that, to, that we must curb global emissions um, by half by um, 2030 if we are to meet the Paris Accords goal of um, holding warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So if you haven't had a chance to look at this um, graph, it's pretty striking and stunning what would, we would need to accomplish right, to make that, um, to hit that 1.5 degree target. And so across the world, we are seeing these campaigns that are called Ready for 100, where 100 refers to 100% renewable energy. Um, and this is part of this move to electrify everything, to, to electrify society in um, the process of creating a new, a new post-carbon economy. So this is a Sierra Club, campaign called Ready for 100. Um, we see pledges coming from many nations and cities. Costa Rica um, in 2017 was um, sort of set the, the record for almost running an entire year on renewable energy. This is the city of London's um, pledge to be a zero carbon city. In the United States, sorry, that's cut off. Um, in Jan, excuse me, in September, Governor Jerry Brown proclaimed um, that California would go 100% renewable energy by 2045, which is extremely significant because California's economy is the sixth largest in the world. So it suggested that it could happen, or at least the promise could be made at a certain scale. And in the United States, just very recently in December, the largest, the country's largest energy util electricity utility, Excel, committed to 100% carbon-free electricity. So you sort of see this move towards 100% RE. And um, I learned here in Singapore that DBS announced that it would be the first Asian bank and the first company in Singapore to um, join the RE100 campaign. And so they join companies like IKEA and Google, Apple, H&M, um, so many that have sort of made this pledge to become 100% renewable. And so what this means um, is solutions like this, right? Uh, electric vehicles, wind turbines, solar panels, LED lights, a sort of suite of what we would think of as green technology or, or climate solutions. So just, I wanna pause for a minute and and how we can think together about what this would mean for an economy like the United States. What would it mean if the US was powered on 100% renewable electricity? And, and so this is how, this is one vision of that in terms of the breakdown of where that electricity would come from, right? And so if you just look at this slice, this 30% energy mix, what this translates for the United States is uh, 250,000 wind turbines installed. We have 50,000 now. So just in this sliver, it's a five-fold increase. So it is an enormous challenge to get to 100% renewable energy, especially for an economy this large. So the question I've asked is, 
where will the metals come from that will undergird this shift? You know, can we possibly mine enough metal responsibly and sustainably to make this future real? And so that's been the guiding question for this project. And I just want to pause for a second. I'm sure not every one of you is, um, uh, has a good sense of what rare earths are. So I just wanted to pull forward the periodic table to talk about the 17 lanthanide elements that we can think of as rare earths. Um, and so they include scandium, yttrium, neodymium. And um, you know they're not actually rare. They're pretty abundant, but they're very hard to, to access to process, and that's why we refer to them as rare earths. Now these have been dubbed vitamins of industry, uh, more recently as green tack metals, um, because the unique magnetic, luminescent, catalytic qualities of these elements make them very hard to substitute for other elements in manufacturing processes. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why their scarcity is, is something of concern. So recently, the World Bank uh, put out its first study on um, green tech metals. And this, to me, was a red flag that the bank is going to invest in this area of development. And what they described was a skyrocketing demand for certain elements, for certain rare earths, if we are to meet the Paris Accords. And so I just grabbed one image from this study. And what this key shows is this is if we hold the planet to two degrees warming, to four degrees warming, or business as usual, which is predicted as six degrees warming. And so what I just want to demonstrate here is the increase in demand across these metals if we are to pursue the Paris Accords. Um, and this is a study from last, from last year. So where do these metals come from? Where do, where do they come from now? Right, so here's an example of um, lithium mines in the Atacama Desert in Bolivia, right? um, but this is what everyone really thinks of, is mining in China. This is lanthanum mining in China. And this is dangerous. It's dangerous to people. It's dangerous to ecosystems. Um, the organization China Water Risk describes it in this way, that one ton of rare earth produced results in this sort of level of contamination. Right? And this is true whether it's in China, um, but also in the United States or other regions of the world where this mining happens. So it is, it is dangerous to produce these rare earths. Now, China is the predominant supplier of rare earths for the world, pretty much the, the only source. And you can see that uh, to, right now we're at between 97 and 99 percent of the world's rare earths coming from China. And it, for the U.S., that China has proven to also be a very unstable trading partner. You likely know that we're in the midst of a trade war between the U.S. and China, and geopolitical tensions around this topic really peaked in 2010 when China cut its exports of rare earths by 40% um, in the midst of a territorial dispute with China. This um, was then taken to the WTO tribunal, and the U.S. and the EU and Japan were sort of resolved um, that China should open up their exports. Um, but it is a very tense political issue. If you're interested in where the metals come from, they're coming from these regions of, of China. This is um, you know, by province. And China has a great internal demand for rare earths as well. So there's a sense of um, vulnerability um, in terms of how much China will export. If their own domestic demand increases, it may be that they hold it for domestic production, but it's also considered to be a tool in um, geopolitical relationships. This is an image from the New York Times story from this past um, July where you know, the, the news is speculating, could rare earths be a way that China exploits the trade tensions with the U.S.? It is still seen as um, a weapon to cut off rare earth um, exports. So in my research, I think of three predominant ways that nations are trying to address you know, what I can think about as this metals crisis. And this crisis is socially manufactured. It's, it's a, a crisis because we've established it as such, and we can talk more about that. But the three I want to outline for you is this idea of repatriating mining back to the industrialized countries and to the United States, thinking about recycling, and then also thinking about repair. Now, repatriation is 
really the primary strategy by the United States and other industrialized countries, I want to insert these additional two as options that we should really be thinking about seriously. So as many of you may know, President Trump is very much into mining and into resurrecting the mining industry in the United States, high on the administration's agenda. This was the executive order that was signed a, a little over a year ago in 2017, which was meant to boost U.S. domestic um, supplies of critical metals. Similarly, um, President Macron has um, similarly committed to resurrecting France's um, rare earth mining industry, both in terms of the nation's subsoil territory in France, but also its colonies abroad. So it's not just the United States that's thinking about repatriating here. And this is in terms of new sources of critical minerals, um, but also thinking about um, extending or simplifying the permitting process by which a company would be able to mine. So it has many, many facets. Right. So while today most of the rare earths come from China for the United States, it has not been that way historically. Um, in fact, in the 1950s, between the 1950s and the 19. 90s, Molly Corp, a corporation which is located in California, not far from Las Vegas, uh, met all of the domestic demand in the U.S. for rare earths and one third of the global demand. And it really wasn't until in the 1980s that the United States passed really strong toxics legislation that this mine became no longer feasible because it was um, having so many wastewater leakages and it was a fairly toxic operation. So the passage of those strict environmental regulations essentially put this site um, out of business. And there have been periods where it has come back online for short periods of time on a set of new permits, but really in 20, about 2015, the company filed bankruptcy. And um, actually, just this last year, this site was bought up by a Chinese mining consortium. So it is also now owned by the Chinese. Even if this mine was operational today, the United States would need eight mountain pass sized facilities just to meet the demands for magnets for the wind energy industry. All right, so I'm just trying to give a sense of scale for the metals demand. So the United States actually has ample deposits, domestic deposits of rare earths. The challenge again is permitting. Right now it takes about 10 years for a mining operation to receive a regulatory permit. And so that is where the lag is and why the Trump administration is trying to ease up the regulatory um, hurdles in order to mine. So since Trump has been elected, both the House and the Senate have passed bills for more research, for fast tracking projects, for extending loan guarantees to mining companies in this industry. And so right now we see new mines being prospected all over the United States, particularly in the West. And I'll give you some examples. This is Wyoming. This is um, Western, Western Central United States, um, where this company, Rare Earth Elements, is, uh, has a proposed mine that they've actually now received a permit for, but this project is stalled because they don't have the capital to actually open the mine. This um, is uh, Alaska, the Yukor Rare Metals Project, which is probably the closest to actually opening because it's gotten a lot of financial assurance from the state government, um, still almost a decade out from actually producing rare earths. Where I live in Minnesota, there is a project on the edge of um, a national wilderness area called the Boundary Waters, which has been an extremely contentious project. And, and it looks like they're likely, with the Trump administration support, going to receive permits to mine here. But it's still a, almost a decade of, from, away from production. So uh, some other examples here in our research, we've been looking at case studies from across the United States. This is the Alaska Project, Wyoming, here in Minnesota, but there are, there are many others. And what we've also done is try to understand what is being mined, right? The level of controversy, right? Is, this, um, is there public acceptance around these projects? And what the status is. And so you can see that with the exception of this one, they are all either underway or they're stalled. And the, the point of being stalled is they could be stalled for, for decades. And so what I'm trying to impart here is that across these examples, right, beside this 
this um, sense of urgency that's coming from the federal government, the need for expediting these projects, in, particularly in response to the Chinese-US trade war going on right now, is actually exceedingly difficult to launch a new era of rare earth mining in the United States, even in some of the most mining friendly regions of the US. Um, they require immense capital investment from global companies. They face a very volatile commodity market, um, and then in many cases experience very little public support where these mines are going to be open. So then that brings me to this question, if repatriation isn't working, what are other alternatives? And so I wanna to turn to this question of recycling. Right? If we want to mine responsibly, right, maybe we need to think not about underground and, and open cut mines, but we need to think about recycling instead. So today, less than 1% of rare earths are recycled. The United Nations Environment Program found that, that in some cases, recycling rates are high for um, things like palladium or for platinum, but there are a whole other suite of rare earths for which there is no recycling infrastructure, um, iridium, tellurium, things that we require for photovoltaics in particular. And so if we want to think about this as an alternative, we have to create that infrastructure to make that happen. And that is um, a significant challenge in the United States where there, there are no laws that would require this to be. In Europe and in Japan, it's a different story, and I can, I can tell you a little bit more about that. So I've been working on this theme of urban mining. Is this a term that's familiar to any of you? Um, it's very familiar if you, if you talk to both citizens, scholars in the EU and in Japan. It's virtually not known in the United States. Um, so this idea of urban mining is, um, this is how I define it at least, um, recycling from the technosphere. So thinking about all of the metals that are already above ground and in circulation in our economy. So this could be in our buildings, in our facilities, in our, in our devices, you know, the things that make up our high-tech lives. So I think about urban mining as a kind of emergent epistemology. Uh, it's distinct from what we would think of as primary mining or virgin mining, and not just because it's urban, right, it's, it's non-rural, it's not just the spatial piece, but in terms of the infrastructures, the institutions, the instruments that we would use to, to develop an urban mine. And it's also a form of disruptive innovation, at least that's what to argue it's disruptive, because it's more about shifting the patterns of consumption and waste collection than it is about digging up the earth. So it's about how we collect, sort, upcycle metals rather than source them from, from the ground. So for me, science and technology theory as a social theory is powerful at tracing sort of moments of emergence and consolidation. So to sort of see urban mining in this moment of emergence. And I want to think about the discourses, the objects, the practices that are helping this come into being. So I'm gonna share with you, just highlight a few examples that I see from around the world that are parts of the research that I'm doing now. And just to make the case of the value of urban mining, um, example of um, cell phones here, um, that if we had 10 kilograms of scrap that we would get metals from things like mobile devices, they would be equivalent to mining 100, excuse me, 10,000 kilograms of, of ore. Right? So there's an economic incentive to mine from our devices rather than from primary production. So one of the things my research lab has been doing is trying to take note of where urban mining is happening around the world. And so this map describes for you places where there are business initiatives, research initiatives, government programs that are going on under the name of urban mining. And so you can see this, I think we have about um, 80 to 100 nodes on this map and it's growing every day, but you can see this um, sort of critical mass in Europe and that's what I'm very interested in exploring. And one thing I'll also note is there's vast kinds of informal urban mining happening everywhere in the world. I just came from India and Vietnam where you see um, men and women passing alleyways, collecting metal scraps all over, and that certainly is ubiquitous. Right? 
I think of urban mining in a different way. And it's quite likely that in some countries it will swallow up some of the informal urban mining that's already happening. When we think about urban mining, these are often government-directed formal programs um, to operate at scale in the collection of metals and to make them available for business. So the, I don't want to suggest that that informal sector is not very alive, it certainly is, but I'm talking about kind of a different organizational form. So some quick examples for you. In Tokyo, the, uh, the Olympics will be held in Tokyo in 2020, and there is a project to um, urban mine the metals that will create the silver, gold, the bronze metals. And this project has been interesting to me as I think about how, how are they doing this collection process. So there are 1,500 um, municipal authorities that are participating. The, um, your household devices can be dropped off at post offices at many different kinds of collection outlets and then are then being processed. Um, so when I looked at the status recently, this is what they're telling their citizens that they've already uh, mined 100% of the bronze that they'll need but are still struggling to find the silver and gold to get to the target levels. So that um, is one example. This is an example from the city of Amsterdam, where Leiden University is prospecting the entire city of Amsterdam as an urban mine. And so their quote here, Amsterdam is an urban mine. Amsterdam is tons of steel, copper, aluminum, gold, and, and it exists in all these forms. If you need metals, go prospecting in Amsterdam. And Amsterdam is a very curious example to me because it is such an old city. Right? and you have sort of layers of, of civilization. Um, so this is a heat map where you know, they're projecting where some of these metal supplies might be. So it's interesting for some of our newer cities to um, take, a, take a lead from, from Amsterdam. Um, this is the um, urban mining platform for the EU, and you can look under ProSum to um, find out more. It's a 17-member um, state project and what they are doing through this project is uh, mapping the flow and scale of metals that might be available for processing and one of their conclusions is that Europe can potentially mine two million tons just from used batteries per year. One more example comes from Sweden. Uh, this is the work of Bjorn Wallstein where he talks about hibernating infrastructures um, in the quest for urban mining. And here, hibernating refers to the kilometers of disconnected pipes and cables that lie just below the subsurface. Decommissioned electrical mains, tr old tram lines, district heating pipes, um, and ask the question, can we excavate these and put them back into circulation? From the city of Rotterdam, we have the Urban Mining Corporation, which um, the way they conceptualize this is the modern city is the urban mine. Um, and we see actually that urban mining is mostly being driven by waste management companies and not necessarily what we think of as the conventional mining sector. And in fact, in some ways, threatens the ubiquitous hold that mining companies have on metals. So that's an interesting feature of this. Um, an, an exception is uh, Umicor, which is a Belgian company. And it's a company that has actually transformed itself from primary mining to what they think of now as being a global metals um, recovery firm. And their website describes themselves like this. You know, they are a two century old mining company, but recently they've shifted their activities from mining and the production of commodity metals to the production, marketing, and recycling of metal based materials. So they, we're seeing these sort of shifts in industry practice as well. But the interesting example I wanted to bring to you is Apple. I, as I say this, I'm working on my Mac. I have my iPhone in my pocket. Uh, what would it mean for Apple to be an urban mining company? In 2017, Apple pledged um, on Earth Day on April 22nd uh, to stop mining rare earths and other metals and instead move towards using all recycled components for their products. And so the question was, well, how could they possibly do this? How could they source every component for something like an iPhone um, responsibly or sustainably? The, they made the pledge and then spent the next year figuring out how they would do it. And in 2018 on Earth Day, they introduced Daisy. And I'm going to show you a short video. Hopefully this will work. Oh, 
hold on. So has anyone ever tried to dismantle their phone? It's very time consuming, very difficult to do it, if you can get past the adhesives and actually get to the core. Um, let's see if I can get back to my screen. So Daisy, Apple's um, computer, new robot uh, exists in a few places, um, Austin, Texas, I think there's one in Europe as well, and she can dismantle about 250 iPhones an hour. And so one question I have is, is the urban mining revolution a robotic revolution? Is this likely how some of this, um, particularly the dismantling piece, will happen? And, and I think it really challenges, at least in the United States, um, our image of who a miner is. You know, we think of miners hard hats, men who toil in very dangerous environments to get medals. And this juxtaposition here with um, Daisy. So let me turn to my last sort of solution, which is repair and the right to repair. So while repatriation and recycling are policy driven and really aimed at the business sector, by thinking about the notion of repair, the right to repair, is um, often focused on consumers. Right, and, and their relationship to corporate, the corporate sphere. So there is a movement, in, uh, particularly in the United States, to force corporations to design our devices so we can repair them, and then in return not, rec not um, go to the store every time our battery stops working or we have a problem with our device. And so this has been known in the US and in the EU as the right to repair movement. And there are 20 laws making their way through state legislatures in the United States, um, in California, in the state where I live as well. Interestingly, there's been some opposition from the, shouldn't surprise us, I suppose, um, from the corporate sector, where on the one hand, Apple has this revolutionary new robot, they are challenging right to repair legislation. Right. So um, this is a story from the Los Angeles Times, um, just from a couple of months ago, that talks about uh, the challenges um, from this movement, and in particular from companies like Apple, from Amazon, from um, John Deere, which is a farming uh, machinery uh, company. And farmers have an interesting role to play in this. They want to fix their own tractors. Right? They don't want to have to go to the company to do so. And so they're part of one of the stakeholders in this movement. Um, oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, this is an example of a new law that just uh, was enacted on Monday of this week in the EU, where manufacturers will now be obliged to take back and make repairable um, some appliances like washing machines, dishwashers, fridges, and also other kinds of smaller devices. So this is interesting because it is uh, something that the U.S. can point to or lead to when we have examples of other, other countries, and in the EU in particular, that are taking up the right to repair movement. And it's on the heels of protests like this. Um, so I, this sign is really interesting to me. In a disposable society, to repair is to rebel. Right. So this is, um, and I'm going to start concluding here, Monami, uh, is an example of the Repair Cafe movement. And so we see these small cafes popping up throughout the world where staffed by volunteers, where you can bring your appliance, your device, and get it repaired. Um, and there are almost you know, 1,500 of them in the EU and many also in the United States. Right. Uh, 
One of the things that I've done at my own campus is run a series of these workshops where, and these are some of my students, where we collect old devices and we dismantle them to become more familiar with the materials themselves and to really ask questions about, well, what, what is in this? How, where would it go once we dismantle it? And it's actually really difficult to do so. It takes a lot of just sheer force to take some of these items apart. Um, so that's one of the things that we've been doing. So I'll just begin to conclude now. Um, so as I trace the sort of emergence of the repatriation side of things, as well as recycling through urban mining and these repair movements, um, these are emergent concepts, they're emergent policy frameworks that we see around the world. I just want to share a few observations um, and some of the questions that I have as I continue to work on this topic. The first is there is a really a dearth of social science um, and humanities research on these fields, particularly on urban mining. And there are you know, tremendous interest throughout the world, programs, research initiatives, new business ventures. Most of the literature is coming out of the science, technology, engineering side of things. Um, very little social science research in particular that looks at um, what this means for society. How will this happen? Who's going to be responsible for, for this shift? And I see in particular three areas of STS, uh, for, for STS theory um, that I think can help me make sense of these new shifts. Um, and this first is this new literature on extractivism. Um, and this is thinking about the processes of extraction, how do we do it, um, what are the cultural, economic, the um, techno-scientific practices for extraction, and how in a case like urban mining, where it's not about ex extraction necessarily, it's about collection. Um, how is that challenging that? There is also some interesting new STS research on toxics and discard, a field called discard studies, right, which um, thinks about toxic assets in a different kind of way. We usually think about toxic assets in the financial realm, but what is a toxic asset um, in the case of mining? And chemical environments and the residues that come with it being part of it. And this is something that I've been trying to be very sensitive to because urban mining is also toxic. Right. In the process of dismantling and making useful um, those metals is smelting, is sorting, that creates its own toxic environments. So how will we think about the trade-offs of the toxicity of primary mining with the toxicities of secondary mining? How will we make sense of that? Um, and then finally, this work on responsible innovation, which I, I understand is of interest here at NTU. Um, you know, responsible mining used to be just focused on the mine site the mine in Papua New Guinea or the mine in Bolivia. And being responsible meant to be responsible to those who live near that mine site in terms of um, sharing the social benefits, the economic benefits of the, of the mine itself. So responsible mining means something quite different in this new era. Right? It's um, extended far beyond just that community around that mine. And when we think about pushing into things like recycling and repair, it challenges what we think of as responsible mining. So one of my interests is to understand why is something like urban mining and repair so much further evolved in the EU than it is in the United States? How do we explain that lag? Um, it's certainly not a consumer. You know, consumers are consuming these devices in, in both regions of the world. And so you know, my hypothesis is this lag is rooted in, in many things. It's a different kind of continental resource geography. In the US, we have a very deep-seated antagonism between the rural and the urban, and that's a challenge. Um, and you know, also, we're, there's a uniquely American consumer psyche and a particular political moment, um, a pro-mining Trump moment, which challenges these kinds of solutions like recycling and repair. And I just want to end with one message um, that I certainly take to my own students and, and my own research community, is that I think the urgent message here for us, and especially those of us who see ourselves as climate change activists and scholars, is that we really need to have an answer for where our metals come from. Right? And if we don't, then we are deeply complicit in creating new sacrifice zones for modern society that will be about the fourth industrial revolution and not necessarily the, the second or the third. And so we have a responsibility to bring these new infrastructures into being at the same time that we um, argue for the urgency of climate change policy and, and activism. It's, a, it's an important um, paradox and challenge. So let me just end with uh, 
a plug for some of the events that we'll have around SCS Underground, especially I don't know if any of you participate in the 4S annual meetings, but um, we are turning our attention to the petrochemical industry in particular as a site of extraction in New Orleans, um, and then having a symposium attached. I'm happy to share with you information about that. And then finally, uh, a photo of some of the students that I've worked with, and a thank you to NSF for funding this research. Yeah, so with that, I welcome your, your comments and your questions. Hi, I'm Ian McGonagall in sociology, also working in STS. Thank you for coming and giving a fascinating talk. I was particularly interested in what you said at the beginning about urban mining as an epistemology. And I was thinking about what kind of questions it might be able to answer. And the one that I'm most curious about is how urban mining can tell us about the political culture mm -hmm. of the context. And so I'm really interested in this sort of counter liberal idea that authoritarian regimes might actually be more effective at these kinds of problems mm -hmm. like tackling long-term issues yeah. like climate change. So what does urban mining in China say about the efficacy of the centralized state? You said it's less, it's, it's less uh, common in the US compared to Europe. It would be interesting if you could expand what, what it is about the political culture that could yeah. explain that. Yeah, thank you for that question. So um, there is now a Society for Urban Mining, which is the academic society that pulls together um, scholars and researchers in this field. Uh, last year, in 2018, the conference was in Italy. In 2019, the conference will be in China. And so China sees itself as a site for urban this mining. This is an academic? This is an, this is a, an academic and a technological community so of people. Practitioners. Practitioners, of the, yeah. yeah. And so this, this struck me as really interesting. So not only is, is China the primary source of the raw material, it's also becoming the, the um, locus of thinking about the future, which is urban mining. And so they're heavily invested in this. And in part, it's to answer these toxicity questions. You know, there's a lot of attention to um, sites, particularly in Mongolia, where the, where the mining of rare earths is happening, and pledges to clean up and make that better. And so the, you see this, um, you know, at the same time those mines are still operational, this parallel um, infrastructure being designed around urban mining as well. It's a completely different story to do that in China than to do it in the United States. I, your, your point. And I just, just a follow-up question. How do you think the current political tensions between the U.S. and China trade wars, how might that reconfigure the circuits of production for things like our mobile phones if a lot of the components are coming from China and you have yeah. this entering the, in the arena? How, what do you think is right. No, and we see that I had a picture from the New York Times story, which um, I, won't, I won't pull it up now, but that was the Linus factory in Malaysia, which is an Apple factory. You know, it's connected to Apple. And so there is deep concern among producers like Apple, um, Samsung, and others about where their, where their um, raw material will come from during this trade war. So there's a lot of pressure on the Trump administration coming from these firms um, because we are 10, 20 years away from having um, a robust rare earth economy in the US. And so one of the solutions is actually new supply alliances. So the US um, has um, sort of invested in new trade relationships with Australia in context of the China U.S. trade war and access to rare earths. But the same is true in Australia. It's, uh, you know, this does not happen overnight. It takes a very long time to locate the deposits, to develop those deposits, to, to um, process the metals, to finally make them usable for industry. And so this um, time lag is very interesting in how we will solve this. Whereas the diplomatic um, time spectrum is very immediate, right? And so you have these two conflicting um, time scales at which companies are caught in the middle, and I think that's just a, fe a feature of this particular moment between the China between the Chinese and the U.S. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, actually, interested to hear you say a little bit more about the, I guess the kind of question about the politics of recycling here, because mm -hmm. it seems to me, I mean. So I, I do some field work in China in the electronics market, and what I see there is exactly like mm -hmm. the picture with your students there with the piles yeah. of phones on the table. But it, one of the things that is very noticeable about that is that it's mostly, I mean, migrant workers, mm -hmm. basically, who are doing yeah. that work, right? And it seems like part of the story that you're telling is kind of the 
increasing corporatization of that recycling, especially with your example from Apple. So, Mm -hmm. and and I guess the question is, is there a risk here that actually by, you know, sort of, as this recycling becomes a bigger part of sort of the sourcing of these Mm -hmm. metals, does it actually displace a whole part, a whole set of workers and a whole part of the economy? Yeah, I'm very interested in this question. And, um, you know, among the, in the field of urban mining, e-waste is where most of the research and discussion is happening, right? Um, I have a colleague who is looking at, at this very question in the context of Egypt, right? Where there is a vast informal uh, scrap metal industry and an interest in formalizing that. And so what are the dislocations that will happen in this sector? It's a very big sector in India, for example. So this is, you know, I'm, I'm interested in this. What happens to those people who are, who are already urban miners, um, but not legally? So in a lot of cases, this is, this is illegal work. It's certainly the case in the United States where um, scrap metal is illegal. It's called a collection of scrap, you know, people are ripping things off buildings, um, stealing things, and then selling them to make money. And so in this transition to an urban mining economy, you will have new surveillance, new legal structures, um, which will certainly have an impact on those who this is their livelihood today. Um, And one of the challenges I've had is how to think about the scale of material that makes its way through these informal um, pathways relative to the demand from industry that can happen through these more formal pathways. And so the European project is really interesting because it's looking at scale. And if you go to the ProSum urban mining platform, you can look across metals, you can look across sectors, electric vehicles, batteries, and you can see where they think the resource is, you know, how much does Germany have versus France versus Belgium. And so it is this, um, this uh, God's eye onto this resource, which is very different than what has been a very ground up, um, you know, very small scale um, industry around urban mining. So this, I mean, there's a lot of people interested in that very question. This is, I don't want to give the impression that it's not already happening. It's happening in a different, very different way. And so for the Japanese case, for the metals, and so that I haven't, I'm going to Japan on Saturday to look, try to understand this better in person, but the images that I've seen of the factories where the dismantling has happened, you know, they are clean, you know, very um, super ultra clean factories, um, masked, uh, white lab coats, sterile glass tables where all the dismantling has happened, which is dramatically different from the way this dismantling is happening in the electronics industry in China, for example. So just there you have this really different juxtaposition and you know, which is, which is better? Who is it better for? And these are questions to ask. Some of the scrap, um, the, particularly the e-waste factories that I visited in the U.S. are totally different kinds of operations. They are usually a place of employment for convicts as they're just emerging back into society. They often have a missionary edge to them. So you have ministers who work there about um, the bringing that person back into productive society. This is the only kind of job that's available. It's very low wage. They're mostly staffed by men. And these are like really just filthy factories that people are working in. Um, with just giant cardboard boxes of of metals that are getting thrown around, and so as this as this emerges, you know, we have all these different kinds of tiers of production already. Yeah. On the back. There's three questions. Yeah. Uh, 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 I think we had two. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering how much of urban mining is actually embedded into uh, rare earth urban mining. Um, so I, I would say that the rare earth piece is the least developed, right? That um, if you look at aluminum, copper, all of these other elements, those are very well developed. In fact, aluminum recycling is um, one of the highest kinds of recycling, in, particularly in the United States. Um, copper also is very well developed. So the rare earth is the, is the um, how should I say, the newcomer to, to, the, um, to the field. And in part, it's driven by the fact that a lot of the technologies that have embedded rare earths haven't reached the end of their life cycle. And um, so if you think about photovoltaics, if you think about wind turbines, many of those came online in the 80s and 90s. They have a 20 to 30 year lifespan. So we're looking at you know post-2020 when those things reach their end of life and then they will be potentially recycled. Um, but the recycling infrastructure 
really isn't there. I've been looking into the case for wind turbines. Um, in the United States, there are hundreds of thousands of wind turbines that will be coming offline um, in the next 10 years because they're reaching their, their you know, limits to their efficiency today. And the towers can be recycled, they're mostly aluminum, but when you look at the gearboxes and the blades, you know, some of that's gonna be landfilled because there isn't a recycling infrastructure for those pieces yet. And this is um, a big issue in Germany as well because they really built up their wind industry in the 1980s. And so you know, this is about forecasting the future of recycling for these new uh, materials and commodities that will hit the waste stream in the next 10 years. Yeah. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I like the interdisciplinarity particularly. I have had a lot of comments and questions, but maybe we can do it also later. Mm -hmm. One is um, the, uh, the restriction of urban mining we, we did not mention, I think, is if you are not able to get out every, one, every single metal. Because yeah. once metals are back together yep. in a mixture, uh, it's chemically very yeah. uh, difficult to remove mm -hmm. them from each other. It's a question of mm -hmm. cost, and mm -hmm. business case, and so uh, you, you can get out some of the metals, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. some uh, is almost not possible to remove. I think that's a problem. Yeah. Another point is uh, you mentioned the um, low interest in uh, of the consumers in the USA to do repairs. Uh, when I, as a European, when I come to USA, I realize that everything is much cheaper there, mm -hmm. in spite of renting apartments, telephoning, mm -hmm. and studying at universities. Everything <laughs> is so much cheaper compared to Europe, and the taxes are lower. But this is something we learn from uh, the rebound effect research. Uh, if we increase any efficiency, we have to do it uh, in combination with this strong regulation. Yeah. And adapted higher taxes, otherwise, mm -hmm. the consumers are not interested mm -hmm. to save anything. But, but that is, um, repair cafes are fantastic. We should also get more information than about life cycle uh, impacts. Yeah. These, um, let's say, very old refrigerators. Um, we s another thing we should do is uh, there is this um, uh, famous plant obsolescence, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. Ink cartridge printers, they have been inbuilt, uh, integrated obsolescence after certain thousands of prints, uh, they stop. <laughs> this would be uh, banned by, by law, so this is yeah. important. So we can do a lot of things. Um, maybe another comment on these alarming reports. We've seen a lot of alarming reports in the last decade saying that we will be uh, running out of mm -hmm. uh, lithium. Mm -hmm. uh, there are at least two big mistakes in these reports. Uh, first, they have to uh, put some of these comments for yeah. later. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, because there's going to be lunch after. What's interesting about? May I respond to just two yeah. two points? Um, so about uh, not relying on consumers to do the right thing. So in the case of the EU, the um, WE directive, the Waste Electronics and Equipment Directive um, from 2002 is what is driving the focus on urban mining. It's almost a 20 year old law that requires producer take back, take back and now more recent versions of it also speak to recycling. And um, similarly in Japan, their first uh, small sort of um, kind of analogous to the WE directives, uh, home appliance laws um, that require producer take back and recycling date back to 1997. So in the US we're at least 20 years behind those regions in terms of having that kind of law and regulation. And, and about planned obsolescence, um, you know, it's, it's very easy to be skeptical of, of Apple's claims at sourcing responsibly on the one hand, then um, you know, challenging the repair movement, um, because at the heart of this is their model of planned obsolescence. So you can take the iPhone that I have and send it to Apple to be dismantled by the robot, um, and I will get a $200 credit that I will use to buy the next newest phone. 
So that is their economic model for investing in urban mining. It's to you know, continue to proliferate newer devices. And they have not promised to make any of these new devices hackable, repairable, and, and that's really what consumers are demanding, right? That, that they, you know, many of them want to be able to hold on to their devices for a lot longer. And so just a, uh, one more quick comment. Uh, one company that has been interesting to think about is Fairphone in Amsterdam, which produces a smartphone that is um, completely transparent. And, and totally hackable. It's almost as expensive as a new smartphone. It's not nearly as sexy and pretty to, to or sleek, um, but it's an interesting market disruption, right, that we see those examples in the marketplace now. Yeah, so I don't know about the cost of the daisy machine. They have not published that, and there's, I think it's still prototype. Um, but the claims that are made is it is 30 times more expensive to get the metals from the primary metals from a virgin mine compared to being urban mined. And so there's a being 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 recycled. Well, no, yeah, I think that right. Um, I think the comparison is to the right. It's it's uh, to the cost of the primary production is so expensive relative to the collection piece. And so that is a figure that I've seen that um, is just that the urban mining industry describes. Uh, but it's not so specific as to say the cost to Apple. Right? But they are trying to make the business case for recycling versus primary, primary mining. And I just want to add that this is something that the mining industry is well aware of. I have been attending uh, mining conferences, particularly for mining engineers, and they, their mining conferences are all about their negative public perception and the sense that they have to um, they ha mining has to be different and it has to have a different public profile and so things like urban mining are creeping into the notion of the circular economy is creeping in to mining engineering because of essentially because of this public relations problem they see that they're an industry that um, is seen very negatively across the world any other questions from anyone Okay, so there's some uh, lunch outside, and before we adjourn, I just want to make a plug for the STS Research Cluster, which we are really trying to encourage um, people, not just in the social sciences and humanities, but across the university to join, to so really try to think interdisciplinary about some of these issues. Um, so please sign up if you're interested, and uh, with that, if we can uh, give Professor Blackie a final applause. Oh, thank you.